Partial range of motion training for more strength gains. Does that sound too good to be true? Well, it likely is true. So stick around and find out how to use partial range of motion within your training to get stronger. Welcome back. Soon to be Dr. Milo Wolf here with Wolf Coaching. And today we're talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And that's because my PhD is actually on this very topic. My PhD was on range of motion and its impacts on muscle hypertrophy and strength. And today we're talking about why incorporating some partial range of motion training in your program might actually lead to better strength improvements compared to just doing full range of motion. Now, you may have seen people in your gym do partial reps on the bench or on the squat, you know, doing those half squats or not going all the way down on the bench. But that's not really what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about using partial range of motion as a way to gain more strength in your full range of motion one rep max, whether you're a powerlifter or just someone who wants to maximize your strength in a given lift. So without further ado, you know the deal. Let's talk about the science. We have seven studies looking at the idea of adding partial range of motion training to your full range of motion program. Of these seven studies, three were performed on the bench press, three were performed on the squat exercise, and one was performed on the leg extension exercise. Let's start with the bench press. There's been three studies. Two have been conducted by Massey and colleagues back in 2004, 2005, and one by Clark and colleagues back in 2011. Both Massey studies were super similar, both in terms of methods and outcome. Essentially, they had participants either train their bench exclusively with a full range of motion, or the other group train their bench with 50% sets with a full range of motion, and the other half of their sets with a partial range of motion, doing about half the full range of motion on the bench, not coming quite all the way down. In both of these studies, they measured bench press one rep max in a full range of motion, so coming all the way down to their chest, and they saw that both groups gained a similar amount of strength. In other words, replacing some of your volume with partial range of motion on the bench didn't seem to lead to any worse strength adaptations than just doing all of your volume as full range of motion. Finally, the study by Clark and colleagues had participants either do all of their training with a full range of motion, or do a quarter of their training with a full range of motion, touching their chest on the bench and locking out fully, a quarter of their volume with just quarter reps, a quarter of their volume with half reps, and a quarter of their volume with three quarter reps. In this study, strength improvements were pretty similar across the groups, with one exception. The group doing partial range of motion training saw greater force production improvements near lockout on the bench, that last quarter of the rep, than the full range of motion group did, likely because they actually spent some time training in that range of motion and training pretty hard. So for the bench, not super convincing results some very slight potential benefits to doing some partial range of motion training, but nothing crazy. Generally though, you'll notice that the difference between the full range of motion group and the group doing variable range of motion is generally leaning towards neutral to positive in favor of the variable range of motion group. So at the very worst, you're not really missing out on anything, and at best, you might be gaining some slight advantages. As I mentioned earlier, there's been three studies on the squat. The first one by Bazeiler and colleagues compared doing exclusively full range of motion squats in their program versus doing full range of motion squats and partial squats. In these partial squats, participants descended until about 100 degrees of knee flexion, which is right around parallel depending on how the squat is executed. So the variable range of motion group did half their training with a full range of motion squat and half their training with that restricted depth squat. What they found is that there were greater one rep max improvements in their full range of motion squat in the variable range of motion group. So actually replacing half of their volume with shallower squats, as opposed to just doing all of their squats to full depth, appeared to result in greater one rep max strength improvements. The second study that only looked at the squat was performed by Whaley and colleagues. In this study, one group just trained with a full range of motion during the whole study and progressed by adding weight to the bar week to week. The other group, called a progressive range of motion group, stayed at the same weight week to week, but actually went from doing a very shallow squat, like a quarter squat, to gradually doing more and more range of motion until they were doing the same range of motion as the full range of motion group. This is a pretty interesting study design and it's something that people have done in practice a good deal, but actually the improvements in one repetition maximum as measured with full range of motion weren't any different between groups. They both gained a similar amount of strength. The final study on the squat actually incorporated four different exercises. The squat, the leg press, the deadlift, and the leg curl. One group did all of their exercises with a full range of motion whereas the other group did half of their training with the top half of the range of motion and half of their training with the bottom half of the range of motion. And actually, strength improvements as measured by a full range of motion, one repetition maximums in these four exercises were similar between groups. So overall, the data on the squat 
seems pretty compelling. Again, neutral to positive effects, but actually more notably positive compared to the bench press. Finally, the seventh study was looking at the leg extension exercise. This was a study performed by Pedrosa and colleagues where they compared four conditions. Participants' legs were randomized to one of these four conditions. The first condition performed all of their leg extensions with a full range of motion, getting a full stretch and a full contraction. The second condition performed only the top half of the full range of motion as partial reps. The third condition performed only the bottom half. And finally, the fourth condition performed half of their volume as top half reps and half of their volume as bottom half reps. They measured strength using one repetition maximums in each of these ranges of motion. So a full range of motion one of max, a bottom half one of max, and a top half one of max in the leg extension. Here's the interesting thing. By just doing half of their training in either of the halves of the range of motion, condition four, doing half their training in both the top half and the bottom half, saw similar improvements in their partial range of motion one rep max, as did the partial range of motion groups who just did all of their training in the respective range of motion being tested. However, with regards to full range of motion strength, the group doing half their training at the top half and half their training in the bottom half, so condition four, saw similar but greater improvements in full range of motion strength than the full range of motion group who did all of their training as full range of motion. In other words, this study is actually pretty compelling evidence that doing partial range of motion training as part of your routine can enhance full range of motion strength, like full range of motion one of maxes, like squatting to depth, etc., more than just doing full range of motion. So when you take all seven studies together, rarely is there a positive effect to not doing partial range of motion as part of your training. And generally, there is a neutral to positive, slightly positive impact of adding in partial range of motion training into your program for full range of motion strength. Now, the question becomes, why is this the case? Well, one reason could be something called a shift in length tension relationship. The length tension relationship is simply describing how much force is your muscle or a sarcomere or a muscle fiber able to produce depending on its length and depending on the joint angle you're trying to make it produce force at. In other words, when you're at 50 degrees of knee flexion, how much force can you produce? At 100 degrees, at 150 degrees, how much force can your quads produce? This is called the length tension relationship. Several previous studies, one of which was performed in 2014 by McMahon and colleagues, have demonstrated that the training can actually shift the length tension relationship. So for example, by doing partial range of motion training in the Clark study in 2011, they were able to shift the length tension relationship such that participants were able to produce more force closer to lockout in the bench. And so, if you're currently failing a lift because you have a weakness in the lift somewhere, like for example on the squat right above parallel, a shift in the length tension relationship, making you stronger at those joint angles where you usually fail, could plausibly make you a lot stronger. Now here's the caveat with targeting a weakness in a given lift. It is quite difficult to accurately diagnose a quote unquote weak point or weakness in a given lift. After all, if you load a bar heavily enough, you will eventually fail you're not able to lift infinite weight. And just because you fail a lift at a given point does not mean it is inherently a weak point. It could just be where you're supposed to fail, but you're just too weak overall to lift the weight. And trying to address that as if it were a weak point wouldn't really yield any positive results. You just need to get stronger overall. For example, in the case of the squat, failing right above parallel is a very common failing point. It is not necessarily a weak point, you just need to get stronger overall. The same goes for the bench press a few inches above the chest, or for the deadlift, especially sumo, right off the ground. There are certain points in the lift that just seem to be the hardest, regardless of whether or not you have any weak points. And so if you rush to think that you can diagnose a weak point easily, you may just spin your wheels trying to address it. At any rate, if you genuinely do think you have a weak point in a lift, partial range of motion training may be a way to address it and thus get stronger overall by removing a limiting factor within that lift. Another reason why incorporating partial range of motion training within your program could be beneficial is by allowing each part of the range of motion to become more stimulative. As was illustrated in the Pedrosa study using leg extension, by doing only bottom half or top half training, they were potentially able to use more weight and make each part of that range of motion more stimulating, and as a result, actually got stronger through a full range of motion than the full range of motion group did. It's possible that this is the case because you're able to make each part of the range of motion more stimulative as opposed to a full range of motion where you would typically consistently fail or experience the most difficulty at certain parts of the lift. In the squat, for example, the last 30% of the lift is actually quite easy. So unless you do some partials, you will never be able to load that part of the range of motion 
sufficiently for it to become stimulative enough. One final mechanism that could help with partial range of motion and improving your strength would be something called lengthened partials. In metal meta-analysis, we looked at the effect of muscle length during training on hypertrophy. And indeed, it seems that training at longer muscle lengths is beneficial for hypertrophy. So if using a partial range of motion within your training allows you to train at lower muscle lengths, which induces greater hypertrophy and greater muscle size allows you to lift more weight, using partial range of motion at lower muscle lengths might be one reason or one mechanism as to why partial range of motion can help you improve your full range of motion strength by just making you more yacked. But enough about the science behind how this could work. How would you actually incorporate partial range of motion training into your full range of motion strength training program? Generally, I would not let partial range of motion take up more than about 20 or at the very most 50% of your overall training. If you're seeking a hypertrophy specifically, you may want to try lengthen partials as your partial range of motion training protocol. Generally, as far as how much range of motion you should go through during this training, I would aim for half reps, so about 50% of your full range of motion. If you genuinely think you've diagnosed a weak point or a weakness in one of your lifts, you could do the partial range of motion around that part of the lift that you seem to struggle at. So for example, if on the bench, you seem to struggle around a few inches off the chest, you could just do the bottom half or so and train through that range of motion as a means to get better at that part of the lift. If you don't have a clear weak point that you can diagnose and you're not specifically going for hypertrophy, you may also just do any part of the range of motion. Finally, a word of caution. The finding that adding in partial range of motion training into your routine improves one rep max strength with a full range of motion isn't super consistent, although effects are generally neutral positive. What I will caution against is changing too much of your training to partial range of motion. Indeed, one of the findings of my own meta-analysis was that performance improvements are range of motion specific. So you see the largest improvements in your performance in the range of motion you're actually training. So straying too far away from the range of motion that you're going through in your preferred strength outcome, whether that's a powerlifting squat, powerlifting bench, deadlift, chin up, whatever, may not be wise. Anyways, that's the video. Try incorporating some partial range of motion training into your routine for strength and see whether or not it helps. In the meantime, if you liked the video, please comment, like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in that next one. Peace. It's time for the cat check. So today we have a black and white cat. I will end you. How the f do you reject call? I am so sick of this. Stop. Holy sh**. Why are people blowing up my phone?